I think we can get started, Mark. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Today, I'd like to introduce Angelica Nasserino. Um, she joined our department of GI in the past, um, past August. She completed her undergrad and medical school training here at Georgetown University. Afterwards, she completed her residency and GI fellowship at Lexington Hill Hospital in New York, where she served as the chief fellow. We're excited to have her return to her alma mater as faculty. Dr. Nasserino's areas of interest include an expertise and research are neuro neurogastroenterology and motility. She will be focusing on motility disorders affecting the esophagus, stomach, small bowel, and to the colon. Dr. Nasserino will be using a technology called EndoFlip that maybe she could tell us about a little bit during her talk, a technology that measures esophageal motility making MedStar Georgetown University Hospital one of the few centers in the area to offer this test. Dr. Nasserino will be joining, or she is joining, um, our premier esophageal pathology and motility program developed by Dr. Stan Benjamin, um, led by Dr. Shaveen Shafa, Dr. Karen Polisi, and Dr. John Carroll. She will be offering esophageal high-res manometry testing, wireless and catheter-based pH monitoring and for reflux, and anal rectal manometry for pelvic floor dysfunction in her practice. Thank you, Dr. Nasserino. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Matar, for the very kind introduction. I'm very excited to be back at Georgetown. I'm very happy to talk to you all today about one of my clinical interests in esophageal motility. Um, I have no disclosures to report. Um, so here are my learning objectives for today's talk. I will be focusing on the indications and clinical utility of esophageal motility tested, testing. I will focus on pH, um, ambulatory reflux testing, high resolution esophageal manometry, and endoflip. At the end of this lecture, I hope you gain an understanding of the benefits of these esophageal tests and when to refer to patients to GI for workup. So these are some of the common esophageal complaints we see every day in the GI office. They can include GERD, regurgitation, dysphagia, nausea, vomiting, and non-cardiac chest pain. Esophageal symptoms may indicate the presence of multiple processes, which can include GERD, structural disorders such as peptic strictures, motility disorders such as achalasia, neurological diseases, or even behavioral or functional conditions. Today, I will talk about how we can use esophageal motility testing to help determine the true etiology of a patient's esophageal complaints. So let's first start with some basics on esophageal motility. The esophagus is bounded by the upper and lower esophageal sphincters. The proximal one-third of the esophagus is composed of striated muscles. The peristalsis of the proximal striated muscles is controlled by the vagus nerve. The lower two-thirds of the esophagus is composed of smooth muscle and the peristalsis of the smooth muscle is triggered by the brainstem. The coordination of the peristalsis of the esophageal muscles and the associated relaxation of the upper and lower esophageal sphincters help deliver food safely from the esophagus to the stomach. If there's any issues with either the muscles or the nerves of the esophagus, this may lead to esophageal motility disorders. Here is a photo showing the motility of the esophagus. Again, the esophageal muscles have to contract to bring food down the esophagus, and the lower esophageal sphincter has to relax to let food move from the esophagus to the stomach. So if there's an issue with the peristalsis or the propulsion of food down the esophagus, a patient may complain of dysphagia or regurgitation. If there is an issue at the lower esophageal sphincter, meaning it is not relaxing appropriately, patients may also complain of dysphagia to solids and liquids, which can be seen in conditions such as achalasia, which we will talk about today. Here are just a few examples of the common esophageal motility disorders we see in the clinic, including achalasia, GERD, jackhammer or hypercontractile esophagus, um, esophageal spasms, ineffective esophageal motility. We will talk about how esophageal testing can help lead to these appropriate diagnoses and guide treatment for patients with these disorders. The main esophageal physiologic testing we will focus on today include esophageal high-resolution manometry, ambulatory pH reflux testing, and the new uh, technology endoflip. We will describe each procedure and discuss the indications of each test and their clinical utility. Let's first start with GERD. 
is one of the most common complaints we see in clinic. As we all know very well, GERD is secondary to the reflux of stomach contents that can cause troublesome symptoms. Each year, billions of healthcare dollars are spent on treating GERD. The cost is largely related to proton pump inhibitor use and diagnostic testing. Oftentimes, patients are kept on unnecessary PPIs for years. PH testing can truly help determine true acid reflux burden and help tailor the treatment of this very common disorder. The typical symptoms of GERD include heartburn and regurgitation. Extraesophageal or atypical complaints of GERD can include chronic cough, laryngitis, and non-cardiac chest pain. While typical symptoms are usually more in line with reflux, it can often be difficult to clinically discern whether these atypical symptoms are truly related to acid. So this is another example of why pH testing can be helpful. The management of GERD commonly starts with complementary lifestyle and dietary measures and an empiric trial of antacids or proton pump inhibitor therapy. If patients fail to improve with optimization of PPIs or any alarm symptoms develop, such as weight loss or iron deficiency anemia, an endoscopy is performed. These are some of the disorders we are looking for in ruling out during an endoscopy. If patients, in patients with alarm symptoms, we want to rule out malignancy. In patients with persistent GERD, who, with symptoms that persist despite PPI use, other etiologies we are trying to rule out can include eosinophilic esophagitis, a hiatal hernia, or even an inlet patch. This is why an endoscopy is part of the workup in GERD. If, however, the endoscopy is normal, and the patient is not improving with appropriate PPI therapy, we can consider that they may have refractory GERD. As we all know, PPIs are very effective for acid suppression, especially at the maximal 40 milligram PO BID dosing. And when evaluating patients with refractory GERD, the first thing is to ensure that PPIs are taken appropriately. They should be administered 30 to 60 minutes before breakfast, and it even may take up to two months to see a maximal effect. If patient symptoms are still persistent despite PPI BID dosing, it may lead you to question whether they are truly having acid reflux. Perhaps etiology such as functional heartburn or motility disorder may be causing their persistent symptoms. Functional heartburn, for example, is defined by the presence of heartburn symptoms but without any acid exposure. And then we can discover this on pH testing. Objective testing with ambulatory reflux monitor can truly help determine acid burden. Again, reflux testing is helpful in patients with normal endoscopy, with refractory, GERD, or atypical symptoms such as cough, throat clearing, and we want to determine whether their symptoms are truly related to acid reflux. There are two different types of pH testing that we can offer our patients. The first is catheter-based testing or pH impedance, and the second is wireless Bravo pH capsule. Today, we will talk about both tests. With catheter-based testing or pH impedance, the patient is unsedated and we take a thin, flexible catheter with sensors and we slowly advance it intranasally. The placement of a pH impedance catheter is very similar to how an NG tube is placed. This patient goes home with this catheter sticking out of their nose. And for the duration of the study, which is usually 24 hours, we are able to get information about acid exposure in the esophagus. The sensors are able to detect acid moving from the stomach into the esophagus. And these are the parameters we are able to measure with the pH impedance catheter. Again, the sensors can determine the total time the patient spends in reflux. And based on the pH sensors, we can tell if the reflux is acidic, weakly acidic, or alkaline. We have the patient stop antacid medications or PPIs before this reflux test, so as to get an accurate representation of true time spent in reflux. Furthermore, every time a patient has a symptom of what they believe is acid reflux, whether this be heartburn or cough, they press a button, and we are able to analyze in real time whether their symptoms are truly attributed to acid, and this is called symptom association probability. Here's an example of what the pH impedance study looks like. And I want to briefly explain how we look at these studies so you can get a sense of the usefulness of a pH impedance. 
Patient A and patient B both present to the clinic with refractory GERD. Impedance is the resistance con to conductivity between two adjacent catheters. Air, for example, increases impedance and has the lowest electrical conductivity, and hence the darker color in patient B. Acid reflux, however, decreases impedance and hence the lighter color in patient A. So based on these two studies, we can see that patient A is truly having acid reflux with a drop in pH, while patient P B actually is just having belching or aerophasia and is not having true acid reflux. This testing can help get to the bottom of what is causing a patient's symptoms. And for patient B, for example, PPA, PPIs may not help his symptoms. Next, we will move on to wireless or Bravo pH testing. Unlike the pH impedance catheter, the wireless capsule is inserted during a sedated endoscopy. Pictured here, you can see the capsule being attached to the esophageal wall during an endoscopy. The patient wake up, wakes up after the procedure and is able to go home without any wires or catheters. The capsule has sensors on it and is thus able to detect acid moving from the stomach to the distal esophagus. And this is an example of a wireless Bravo pH study. The horizontal line across the graph represents a pH of four. Any event that drops below this line correlates with true acid reflux. You can see here the episodes of true reflux are circled. Also, as with the pH impedance catheter testing, the wireless capsule testing also has a patient press a button every time they feel a symptom of what they think is acid reflux. And again, we are able to see in real time whether their symptoms truly correlates to acid. There are pros and cons to each pH study that we offer. The pH, procedure, the pH impedance catheter is unsedated and only lasts 24 hours. Some people prefer this test because they do not have to go through a sedated endoscopy. The Bravo study um, can be done during an endoscopy and it's wireless, so oftentimes patients find it more comfortable. The Bravo study can last up to 72 hours before the capsule falls off the esophagus, so it provides a much longer duration of the information. The pH impedance is helpful at determining whether the patient is having non-acidic reflux, such as belching, as we saw in the previous example, but the Bravo study only tells us about acid reflux. When we see a patient in clinic, we work with them to discuss the pros and cons of each test in order to help determine which test is best for them. I now want to present two short examples of how we use Bravo pH testing in our practice to help guide management. The first case is a 63-year-old male with chronic GERD for over 10 years. He has been on PPI on and off for many years and recently even tried PPI twice a day for three months. He's tried diet, lifestyle changes, and nothing seems to help his symptoms of heartburn. Since he has refractory GERD, we perform an endoscopy, which is notable for a hiatal hernia. Otherwise, the esophagus appears normal with no esophagitis or mass seen. We perform a pH study, and you can see how many acid reflux episodes he has over the course of the study, depicted here by the blue arrows, with a drop in pH below four. After analyzing this 48-hour study, we can see if the, pati the patient is in reflux 10% of the time, which is considered abnormally elevated. His symptoms of heartburn do in fact correlate with acid reflux, and he has a positive symptom association probability. So with this study, we can see that the patient is having true refractory acid reflux. We referred him to anti-reflux surgery, and he is now doing well. This is patient two, a 38-year-old female with a history of anxiety who's complaining of constant heartburn and throat clearing. She has been on PPI for more than five years and says it's only somewhat helpful. This patient has both atypical and typical symptoms of acid reflux. We perform an endoscopy, which is normal, including taking biopsies to rule out eosinophilic esophagitis. Everything is normal, so that is the pH study. This pH study is normal. The total time in reflux is 1%, and her symptoms of heartburn and throat clearing do not correlate with acid reflux episodes. So overall, this is a negative study for acid reflux.
this test was useful for explaining to the patient that she does not have true acid reflux and that she can stop her antacid medication. She has what is called functional heartburn, likely related to underlying anxiety. She can consider medications for her anxiety or even consider acupuncture to help with some of her symptoms, as PPI would likely not help her symptoms. So I want to briefly summarize how we approach patients with GERD in the clinic. We start with diet, recommendations, and PPI trial. If the symptoms persist or any alarm features develop, we do an endoscopy to rule out cancer, strictures, EOE. If the endoscopy is normal and the symptoms of heartburn persist despite optimal PPI therapy, that's when we consider pH testing to truly help determine if their symptoms are related to acid reflux. Based on the results of pH testing, we can determine if they have true acid reflux and help tailor treatment. If they do, or if they are found to have acid reflux, we can consider a combination of medical management and PPI therapy. Anti-reflux surgery can also be considered for truly refractory symptoms. If we determine that they have non-acidic reflux, we can consider medications such as baclofen. And if we determine that their symptoms are not related to reflux at all, they may be diagnosed with functional symptoms and can consider TCAs to help their symptoms. So to once again summarize the indications for when you should refer to GI for pH testing, we use it to work up patients with typical or atypical symptoms of GERD with normal endoscopies and in patients with refractory symptoms. It's also important to note that we perform pH testing prior to any reflux surgery. It's important to make sure that their symptoms are truly due to acid before considering an invasive intervention. Because if someone has functional heartburn, you do not want them to go through surgery because it won't fix their complaints. I now would like to switch gears to another symptom we commonly see in the practice, which is dysphagia. Based on history, it's important to differentiate oral pharyngeal from esophageal dysphagia. Oral pharyngeal or transfer dysphagia is characterized by difficulty with the initiation of the swallow. Swallowing can be accompanied by coughing, aspiration, and a sensation of food remaining in the pharynx. This can often be due to neurological issues. Esophageal dysphagia, on the other hand, is characterized by difficulty swallowing several seconds after the initiation of the swallow, with the sensation of food getting stuck in the esophagus. Today, we will focus on esophageal dysphagia. When evaluating a patient with esophageal dysphagia, the clinical history is very important to help determine the underlying etiology. The age of onset is important as dysphagia in older patients may signify malignancy. The acuity of the symptoms is also very important as very acute onset of the inability to swallow solids or liquids may suggest something such as a food infection. If symptoms, for example, started after a new medication, pill esophagitis could be on the differential and this can classically be seen with antibiotics such as doxycycline. While chronic symptoms of dysphagia may suggest a motility disorder. When getting history, it's also important to differentiate if the dysphagia is to solid foods, liquids, or both. Chronic dysphagia to solids and liquids may signify motility disorder, while dysphagia to solids may be a stricture. Dysphagia to liquids, for example, may signify an esophageal spasm. Progressive dysphagia that first starts with solids and then liquids may signify a stricture or obstruction, obstructing lesion, while intermittent dysphagia may be related to something such as an esophageal ring or web. It's also always important to ask about alarm features such as anemia and weight loss, which again may signify a malignancy. Today, I'm mainly going to be speaking about chronic esophageal dysphagia complaints. The upper endoscopy is always the first step in evaluating obstructive symptoms and should always be performed before considering a motility study. It is imperative to ensure that the patient doesn't have structural or mechanical causes for their symptoms, such as an esophageal ulceration, a stricture, or a cancer, as depicted here. The esophagram is often performed as part of the evaluation for patients with dysphagia. And when ordering an esophagram for obstructive esophageal symptoms, it's important to note that a standardized, upright, timed barium esophagram should be used. In this example, note the stasis of the barium columns at one, three, and five minutes, which can signify an obstruction, obstructing lesion at the G junction, 
which may be due to a stricture or motility disorder such as achalasia. It is important to note that while the esophagram is useful in the assessment of anatomic abnormalities, it has a lower sensitivity for the examination of a detection of esophageal dysmotility. So patients with suspected esophageal dysphagia should be referred to high resolution esophageal manometry, which we will talk about today, to evaluate motility disorders and identify potential treatment targets. While the esophagram provides information about bolus clearance in patients with dysphagia, the manometry provides additive information about bolus clearance as well as the strength of the esophageal peristalsis that cannot be determined based on a barium study. As part of the American College of Gastroenterology guidelines for working out patients with dysphagia, it is recommended that these patients with obstructive symptoms and of course a negative endoscopy undergo an esophageal manometry study. So let's discuss what a manometry is and the protocol of the study. The manometry study is performed while the patient is awake. We again take a thin, flexible catheter with sensors, and the catheter is advanced intranasally down into the esophagus. We ask the patient to take sips of water in the supine and upright position, and we are able to measure esophageal pressures, peristalsis, and bolus transit during the manometry study. The sensors are able to give us information about the strength of the esophageal peristalsis and whether the lower esophageal sphincter is opening appropriately to let food move from the esophagus into the stomach. This color topography represents a normal swallow. Blue and green is lower pressure and red is higher pressure. And this is an example of a normal swallow. As you can see here, the upper esophageal sphincter relaxes, which is represented by this lighter color blue. Then you can see a normal, strong, anterograde esophageal contraction depicted in red, followed by the opening or relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter, depicted here as a blue, blue or green color, which represents lower pressure. There are two important parameters we measure during esophageal manometry. The first is the integrated relaxation pressure, which measures the relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. So if the IRP is elevated, it may signify something such as outflow obstruction or achalasia. The, distal, the DCI or distal contractile integral measures the strength of the esophageal contraction. We can also use a parameter called distal latency to see if the swallow is spastic or premature. Here, let's talk about the, each parameter and how manometry study can help us work up dysphagia. Again, the IRP is a measure of whether the lower esophageal sphincter is relaxing appropriately. In example A, here you can see the relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter circled. This blue-green color represents that it's appropriately relaxing in response to a swallow, as opposed to example B, where the lower esophageal sphincter is not relaxing. It's depicted by the area of high red pressure, and this can signify something such as outflow obstruction or achalasia. Let's spend a few minutes talking about achalasia, which is a primary esophageal motility disorder that we screen for. In these patients, there is absent esophageal peristalsis and the lower esophageal sphincter does not relax appropriately. Achalasia is thought to result from the degeneration of anglion cells in the myenteric plexus in the esophageal wall. And this causes issues, again, with the lower esophageal sphincter relaxing. Patients present with complaints of dysphagia to solids and liquids and can also complain of things such as regurgitation or non-cardiac chest pain. And here's an example of what achalasia looks like endoscopically. In photo A, you can see pooling of secretions in the esophagus and a dilated esophagus. In photo B, you can see a tight or puckering at the lower esophageal sphincter, at the, and this is not relaxing appropriately. And in the last photo, you can see a typical barium swallow, which is showing achalasia. By depicted by the bird's beak. There are three different subclasses of achalasia. The esophagram and endoscopy can help support the diagnosis of achalasia, but cannot identify achalasia subtypes. And this is why a manometry study is useful. All of the types of achalasia have this issue with the relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. In type one achalasia, there is absent swallow. In type two, there is this pan pressurization. So instead of seeing a normal contraction, you're seeing this 
column of pressure. And in type three, you're seeing a premature contraction. Subtype hemochalasia is important because it can influence treatment options. And again, it's always important to do an endoscopy before diagnosing achalasia with a manometry study because a mass at the G-junction, for example, can cause pseudoachalasia. And here are our guidelines that recommend that all patients with refractory GERD undergo a manometry study to rule out achalasia because, again, achalasia can present as GERD not responding to PPI therapy. Manometry studies also help to classify achalasia subtypes. So even if achalasia is diagnosed on an esophagram, you still need a manometry study to help guide treatment. So let's talk about the treatment options for achalasia. A pneumatic dilation is when a very large balloon is used to disrupt the muscle fibers at the lower esophageal sphincter in order to help facilitate its relaxation. This procedure is done during an endoscopy. Oftentimes, patients with achalasia will need repeated dilations. Another treatment option is a surgical hellermyotomy, which involves a myotomy, which is a surgical division of the muscles of the lower esophageal sphincter, which can again help with the relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter, which is the main issue with achalasia. A poem or per oral endoscopic myotomy is a myotomy that can be performed endoscopically. The advantage of this test is that the length of the myotomy can be tailored. Subclassing the type of achalasia with a manometry is very important to tailor treatment options. For example, pneumatic dilation and a myotomy can be used for types one and two achalasia, but the POEM has been proposed as a treatment of choice for type three achalasia, because again, POEM can deliver a longer myotomy. We can also consider Botox injections at the lower esophageal sphincter for older patients who may not be surgical candidates. Now I'm going to move on to how other esophageal motility disorders can be diagnosed with an esophageal manometry. Pictured here are disorders of esophageal peristalsis, meaning that the contraction of the muscles of the esophagus are weak and carrying food down. The IRP is normal, so again, there's no issue with the relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. In A, you can see that there is no esophageal contraction. And in B, you can see that the contraction is fragmented. This looks very different from a normal swallow. This patient with ineffective or absent contractility may have difficulty swallowing, feeling like food moves slowly down their esophagus or that food can get stuck. A treatment for ineffective or weak swallows can often be difficult. A lot of the time it's a behavioral interventions are recommended. We recommend that patients chew their food very carefully, sit upright, drink water with meals. We can also consider bethanicol, which has been shown to improve esophageal peristaltic pressures. But it's also important to know that 100% absent esophageal contractility can actually be associated with autoimmune disorders such as thuroderma. So this should always be considered when evaluating patients. Moving on, here's an example of a hypercontractile or jackhammer esophagus. As depicted here in red, the vigor of the contraction of the esophagus is very high as opposed to a normal swallow. This patient typically presents with non-cardiac chest pain and dysphagia or heartburn. The treatment for hypercontractile esophagus focuses on medical management. GERD can often be associated with it, so we often place patients on PPIs. Calcium channel blockers and nitrates can also help relax smooth muscle, but they can have side effects. Um, we may even consider Botox, peppermint, or tricyclic antidepressants to help with the hypersensitivity that is associated with this hypercontractile esophagus. We use what is called the Chicago classification to classify esophageal motility disorders based on the manometry study. So to summarize, if there's an issue with the relaxation at the lower esophageal sphincter, that can be seen in disorders such as achalasia. And the manometry can also help us diagnose disorders of esophageal peristalsis that can be seen in absent contractility or even jackhammer or hypercontractile esophagus. The treatment is centered on medical management, endoscopy, and surgery. We work in a multidisciplinary approach to guide treatments and help determine what is the best option for the patient. 
Again, the monometry study is so important because it can diagnose the true underlying etiology and help to tailor treatment, whether that be dilations or medical management. To summarize, indications for when to refer patients to GI for monometry studies include patients with symptoms of dysphagia, but again, this is always done after confirming there are no structural abnormalities with an endoscopy. The monometry can also be used for patients with non-cardiac chest pain to evaluate for disease processes such as jackhammer or hypercontractile esophagus. We also perform an esophageal monometry prior to reflux surgery. And the reason being is that the fund application or the wrap can be tailored depending on the esophageal reserve. So for example, if someone has weak esophageal pressure, a Nissen fund application may cause dysphagia. So this patient may undergo a partial wrap instead. The monometry study is a very safe procedure and is performed while the patient is awake. So contraindications really include decreased level of consciousness. And this is mainly because patients have to be able to follow instructions during the test. And of course, a monometry study should be avoided in patients with a history of nasal surgery since a catheter is inserted in their nose. It's considered a very safe procedure. It's unsedated, takes about 20 or 30 minutes. And the biggest complaint with patients is just maybe gagging or throat irritation or, or nosebleeds. Um, but again, a lot of these patients that we see with motility disorders have often suffered for a long time, so they want to get their procedure done so as to get answers to their clinical concerns. I'm now going to switch gears and end with um, a new device we have here at Georgetown, the EndoFlip, which is a functional lumen imaging probe. This is a new tool that we can use to measure esophageal motility during an endoscopy, which is unlike the manometry, which is performed while the patient is awake. The endoflip catheter is a thin, flexible catheter with sensors and a balloon. During the procedure, the balloon is inflated, and this inflated balloon acts to simulate a food bolus. And when inflated or distended, it should stimulate esophageal contractions, and we're also able to measure how the lower esophageal sphincter opens in response to inflating the balloon. What parameters does endoflip measure? The most important one is the sensibility index. And again, this is how well the lower esophageal sphincter relaxes in response to balloon distension. It is also able to measure peristalsis and the diameter of the esophagus. These parameters are similar to the parameters that are measured during esophageal manometry, but are performed during a sedated endoscopy. So let's talk a little more about the sensibility index and how we can use endoflip to diagnose motility disorders. So again, the sensibility index is important for measuring the opening of the lower esophageal sphincter in response to the balloon distension. Again, this is similar to the IRP we were just discussing with the manometry. So how is the sensibility index calculated and what are considered normal values? So the sensibility index is basically the ratio of the cross-sectional area of the esophageal gastric junction and the balloon pressure. The normal value is three. So the value of three or above means that the lower esophageal sphincter is opening or relaxing appropriately when the balloon is distended. Anything below two, for example, below three, for example, is considered reduced and abnormal. The lower esophageal sphincter is not opening appropriately to balloon distension. And this is what you can see in motility disorders such as achalasia or even strictures. So here, pictured here, let's look at a few examples. On the right, you can see that this has a low desensibility index and a very high pressure band measured in red. This is similar to showing that the lower esophageal sphincter is not opening or relaxing, because again, red is very high pressure. On the left, you can see that there are normal esophageal peristalsis, and in between each peristalsis, you can see that the lower esophageal sphincter is relaxing. So this is considered a normal study, as opposed to the other study, which can be seen in something like achalasia. This photo again here shows how endoflip measures the, how the lower esophageal sphincter relaxes in response to balloon distension. The arrow here depicts the lower esophageal sphincter. We inflate the balloon, and in patient A, we can see that it's opening appropriately, as opposed to B, where you see a much narrower waist. So patient B has achalasia while A has the normal study. So by using endoflip during an endoscopy, we can determine and screen for, dis for motility disorders such as achalasia.
In addition to measuring how well the lower esophageal sphincter relaxes, we can also measure secondary esophageal peristalsis with the endoflip catheter. By slowly inflating the balloon, we should be able to generate esophageal peristalsis. The top row here represents endoflip study, and the bottom row here represents the manometry studies. As you can see, they appear very similar. So here in A, again, you can see normal esophageal peristalsis with relaxation between each peristalsis. While in B, you just see a high pressure band, meaning that the lower esophageal sphincter is not relaxing, and you also do not see peristalsis. What is also very useful about endoflip catheter is that it can measure the diameter of the esophagus. This can help identify subtle strictures that may be missed during endoscopy and can help guide treatment options such as dilations. I now want to provide two examples of how we can use endoflip in our practice. For example, patient one, 47-year-old female with hypertension who comes in with complaints of GERD and also intermittent dysphagia that she said happens a few times a year. We perform an endoscopy and everything looks normal structurally. So we proceed to endoflip to measure the motility of the esophagus. In this study, again, you can see normal esophageal secondary peristalsis. And we can see that the patient has a normal desensibility index, meaning that the lower esophageal sphincter is relaxing appropriately. So based on this information that we used endoflip during the endoscopy, we can get a sense that this patient does not have a major motility disorder. And instead, we should focus on his symptoms of GERD and we can prevent this patient from having to go through an esophageal manometry by again using endoflip at our index endoscopy. Now patient two, 68-year-old male with chronic dysphagia to solids and liquids, as well as weight loss. We perform an endoscopy, which shows a dilated esophagus, but we don't see any masses or cancer. We perform endoflip, and in this case, you can see a high pressure zone in red. There's no relaxation and there's no peristalsis seen. And this is consistent with achalasia. What is also very useful about endoflip is that it can be used during procedures. Um, for example, we discussed myotomies and pneumatic dilations are treatment options for patients with achalasia. And we can use endoflip to tailor their therapy and ensure that the patient will have clin clinical benefits from that intervention. For example, in photo A, this is a patient with untreated achalasia. And again, you can see this tight or narrow waist representing a tight lower esophageal sphincter. After my, my, my myotomy is performed, the lower esophageal sphincter should open more as in photo B, which signifies a successful myotomy and the patient should have clinical response. This is opposed to patient C, who has a very, still a very tight lower esophageal sphincter. So maybe they need more of a therapeutic intervention. So again, endoflip can really truly help tailor treatment options in real time. So how does this new tool of endoflip compare to esophageal manometry? Recent studies have shown that patients with normal endoflip who go on to have manometry studies also have normal manometry studies. So this new tool has been shown to positively correlate with manometry studies. But it is important to note that endoflip does not equal high resolution manometry. It cannot yet replace it. It is additive and complementary to manometry. So FLIP measures diameter and sensibility in response to a balloon distension, while manometry, which we talked about earlier, measures pressures in response to swallows. There are pros and cons to each study and each one carries their own limitations. But when used together, it can help provide very useful information about esophageal motility disorders. So here's a summary of the clinical indications for endoflip. We can use that index endoscopy of patients with dysphagia, and this is a screening test for motility disorders. It's also very helpful when manometry studies are not tolerated by patients. And I've also showed examples of how it can be used to assess response to therapeutic interventions such as diet, dilations and myotomies. It's a safe procedure, and the main contraindications to endoflip is when an endoscopy is contraindicated. And of course, you want to avoid inflating a balloon in anyone with a history of varices or active bleeding. So in summary, when patients present with symptoms of GERD, dysphagia, regurgitation, or non-cardiac chest pain that is not responsive to typical empiric treatment 
and we do an endoscopy and we rule out structural etiologies. If endoscopy is normal and symptoms persist, we can consider esophageal motility testing, such as pH testing, manometry, and endoclip to help determine if there is a major motility disorder. Ambulatory pH testing can be very useful in patients with refractory GERD or atypical complaints, and we want to see if their symptoms are truly related to acid. High-resolution manometry is very important to evaluate non-obstructive dysphagia and can help diagnose things such as achalasia, jackhammer esophagus, or weak swallows. And we now have endoflip, which is a new tool we have that can measure motility during an endoscopy. It can be very helpful for the diagnosis of motility disorders and also help to tailor therapeutic interventions. I hope that now, by the end of this lecture, you've gained an understanding of how esophageal motility testing can help identify the characteristics of each patient and then help deliver personalized management to their, treat, to their major complaints.